Good evening, everybody, and welcome. Welcome to our webinar this evening. That is from the Fondation La Roche Posée. And this evening, we're going to have a discussion on grants, research, and your careers, tips, and how to succeed. So our panelists this evening consist of Dr. Don Eichenfield. And Dr. Eichenfield is Pediatric Dermatology Fellow at the UC San Diego Medical Center and Ratty Children's Hospital. We also have Dr. Adam Friedman, Professor and Chair of Dermatology, Residency Program Director and Director of Translational Research, Director of Supportive Oncodermatology, Department of Dermatology, George Washington School of Medicine and Health Sciences. And we also have Dr. John Harris at the University of Massachusetts Medical School, Worcester, Massachusetts, Associate Professor, Chair Department of Dermatology and Founding Director of the Vitiligo uh, Clinic, and Research Center and Founding Director of the Autoimmune Therapeutic Institute. We'd like to thank our sponsor this evening, La Roche Posée, who has made this educational event possible. A couple of technical tips that will help you out uh, during this session. If you're having issues hearing the webinar, you can listen to the presentation using your telephone. Just select the phone call in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. If you're having technical issues or if you would like to ask a question to our faculty, please submit your question in the question chat pane on the right-hand side of your screen. At the end of this webinar, a survey will pop up in your web browser following the webinar and will be emailed to you one to two days. We'd greatly appreciate it if you could fill it in and send it back to us. And also within one to two days of the webinar, the recording of this program and a certificate of attendance will be emailed to you. Again, if you want to ask questions to our faculty, please go to the chat pane on the right hand side of your screen and I wrote a little note there for you so you can see where you need to type it in. So without further ado, I would like to pass the floor to Tyler Steele, who is Vice President, Medical and Medical Media Relations at La roche Posey. Tyler? Good evening, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm thrilled to be able to share this talk with everyone tonight. Um, La roche Posey is a really interesting brand, and one of the favorite parts of my job is to be able to work on the foundation arm. Um, we do research grants for you, for residents and young dermatologists, uh, fellows, and we also do a dermatologist from the heart program. Um, La Roche-Posay is an interesting brand because it was actually started out of a dermatology hospital in France. They treat up to 8,000 patients a year using water-based balneotherapy treatments. These treatments are actually quite common in France. Um, Roxanne, it's not moving forward, so maybe you can just move it forward for me. Uh, the center treats up to 8,000 patients a year, and those patients are actually written a prescription so that it's covered by the Republic of France. 22% of the patients are children, and the main patient types are atopic dermatitis, plaque psoriasis, and increasingly, a large number of patients are seeking um, skin relief from some cutaneous side effects from some cancer medications. Next slide. Patients actually typically go for three weeks of therapy. As I mentioned, it is written as a prescription and the water-based therapies, and uh, Dr. Freeman's actually been to the center uh, and also sent a patient to the center. The water-based therapies can inc include light facial mists, um, stronger filiform showers that are used to drive the plaques off of the skin and also drive that therapeutic water into the skin. The water has a unique concentration of minerals and elements and also bacteria. Um, beneficial bacteria that help diversify the microbiome. Why that matters in a nutshell is a lot of your inflammatory skin conditions, especially atopic dermatitis and black psoriasis, are missing the diverse bacteria that's associated with healthy skin. And there is a hypothesis from the National Institute of Health that shows a correlation between atopic flares and a lack of diversity or dysbiosis with the skin. What you can see in the bottom left-hand corner is a photo, actually, that's actually Dr. Peter Leo out of Chicago, and he's testing out an oral irrigation that's used to treat the mouth sores from cancer patients. Next slide. And here's just a, a view of that high pressure shower. I joke a lot of times when I mention the center as a water-based clinic, people will often think that it's going to be a pleasurable experience. It is because they receive a great outcome, but the treatments themselves can you know, be quite intense um, for part of the duration, but they have shown 
um, consistent relief for the side effects from some of those skin diseases, as I mentioned, year over year. In fact, the center's been in operation for over 100 years. Next slide. So as I mentioned, they treat from uh, pediatric all the way to geriatric. You will see patients there from toddler age all the way up to people in their 80s and 90s. Typically, your atopic dermatitis patients might be given a prescription to come one or two times a year, typically for up to three years for the relief of those conditions. Next slide. And in addition to the physical treatments from the water, the center also does a variety of quality of life workshops. Next slide. These are intended for people who have various skin conditions, vitiligo, people who've been in uh, accidents that's caused scarring on areas that they might be sensitive to, including the face or upper body. What you see here is a, is a patient who uh, was in a fire, actually. And um, this workshop is intended to give basically camouflaging um, for the cancer patients, a lot of these patients can no longer tolerate the normal cosmetics that they may have been using. Uh, La Roche-Posay in France, not in America, they do offer a number of hypoallergenic, very sensitive skin cosmetics. Um, it's always an interesting thing to bring doctors to this workshop because you really can see the transformation that these people go through, really not just physically, but them feeling good in their skin again and feeling like normal people. Um, and that goes across the board, whether they've been in an accident or they have a skin condition or they're simply recovering from something um, that's just made their skin intolerable to using traditional cosmetics that they may have relied on in the past. Next slide. And the water is, uh, as I mentioned, it has a uh, very unique uh, fingerprint, if you will. It's rich in natural prebiotic bacteria, selenium, as well as unique antioxidant minerals. In addition to being used at the center for physical therapy, patients are encouraged to drink it anywhere between a half a liter and a liter and a half a day based off of um, your doctor's recommendations. They have eight full-time dermatologists on staff, and they treat patients year-round at the smaller clinic and at the larger clinic between um, March through November. Next slide. It all started actually with a chemist who was operating his pharmacy across the street from the clinic. If any of you have been to European pharmacy, you know it's very different from the US. There are no wiffle ball bats, no Frankenstein costumes. That could be a pro or a con for some people. The pharmacists own the pharmacies, so they have a vested interest in treating their patients from birth to death. And because of um, the regulations on drugs there, you don't have the situation where um, you might have a pharmacist actually changing your prescription. They're very good at honoring what the doctor recommends. This chemist began, began compounding, uh, Monsieur Lavier compounding with the water. His belief was at the time, many French skincare products were very heavy in fragrance and dyes, things that would really tend to irritate these patients. And he wanted to help extend the relief that they found at the center. And the brand just became kind of word of mouth. It started at that pharmacy and then other pharmacies started calling and saying, oh, my patient was telling me about these products. I'd like to stock them in my pharmacy. Next slide. Today, the products are still made in the town, um, but of course the pharmacy has grown quite a bit. Uh, the factory is now built above one of the entrances to the spring aquifer. They produce over hundred million units a year. Uh, when L'Oreal acquired La Roche-Posay, they also acquired the water rights to ensure that the water would always be protected and used for the center as well as for the products. Products are tested a thousand times a year for purity and pH. And the water is also made available for people in the town to drink. Next slide. So thank you for bearing with me. That wraps up my part. I just wanted to give you a little bit of background of information on the brand so that it's clear why we're so interested in supporting research and so interested in supporting quality of life programs that really can benefit the patient. But tonight our focus is on research, which ultimately benefits the patient, but I think what you'll find is it can ultimately also benefit you and your career. So thank you so much and a, a very special thank you to Drs. Harris, Dr. Friedman and Dr. Eichenfeld for joining us all past La Roche-Posay grant winners. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to the La Roche-Posay Foundation Chair, Dr. Adam Friedman. Right. Thanks so much, Tyler, and thank you everyone for joining. Um, I, I think just off the bat, uh, it's important to know that when you hear the word grant, this doesn't mean this is for someone who is literally spending 100% time in their lab. It doesn't mean you have to be at some giant institution. Grants can afford anyone in any walk of life uh, of dermatology the opportunity to take a question 
and hopefully answer it with maybe some very basic, um, you know, uh, assays or um, clinical research tools, or maybe it will buy your freedom to give you the time to really explore that question and, and, and flush it out. Um, and as very often, grants are, are really buying your freedom from the clinical administrative responsibilities of whether it be institutional medicine or, or private practice. So uh, as you see on this title slide, um, I received uh, the LaRoche Perse uh, grant back in 2009, um, I believe it was my very first grant. And yes, there's me um, with, with much more hair um, and, and probably fewer wrinkles uh, receiving um, a little placard, which is really unfair because John Harris will be on later when he received this the year before me. It was actually the impetus for me even applying because I saw him with this giant novelty check. I kind of got skimped at the AD that year. So I, I, will, I will never, that's what, we're talking almost a decade later, I still have not let that go. Um, but this grant really served as a stepping off point for me for more grants. Um, and and I'll, we can certainly talk about that. Um, and, and this is one of the papers that was published utilizing that funding uh, to both free up some of my time, uh, but also to purchase mice, um, various reagents, uh, and, and it not only resulted in this paper, but this paper was also, once again, stepping off point, which is a common theme with grants, um, for more papers, more grants, and, and even a biotechnology company that is pursuing uh, clinical indications for this nanotechnology. Next slide, please. Um, the other thing to consider, you know, so there are obviously lots of types of grants. There are federal grants, um, you know, obviously NIH, National Science Foundation. Then you have these, uh, you know, kind of uh, nonprofit or, or foundational grants, uh, organizational grants. So obviously this is one we're talking about, Women's Derm, American Dermologic uh, Surgery, uh, um, you know, is another one. So I would argue that when you get these grants, regardless of what the agency is, look for open doors to pursue other opportunities. So when I received this grant uh, and I you know, got to go out to a nice dinner and get that little placard, not a giant check, um, you know, I got to know um, some of the senior leadership at, at L'Oreal and La roche posay and, and that really, once again, stepping off point to do more. Uh, and that more included educational initiatives, consulting, um, as you see on the lower left-hand corner, um, unrestricted funding for a supportive oncodermatology program that I founded at, at GW that has now been going on for several years, has yielded papers, has taken care of um, really, really sick patients, and has better allowed us to understand um, how to manage these expected adverse events that come from targeted therapies for cancer, for which we really don't have a lot of uh, experience or, or algorithms for. Um, so I, I think in line with not even thinking about grants as, oh, this is you know a check, this is money to pay for something for a set amount of time, also look at a grant as an opportunity to interface uh, with maybe the selection committee, leadership at that that um, that granting body, because um, more doors can certainly open. Next slide, please. All right, so let's get into tips and tricks. So first things first, and this is kind of tough. Very often, a granting agency does not want to fund someone who's never had a grant before. You know, they want to invest in a sure thing, a winner. And so you kind of get stuck in this, you know, this doldrum where like, well, how can I possibly be successful if I don't get my first grant? That is where the low hanging fruit grants come in. And that is not a negative term, it is actually a very positive one. So grants like the La Fondation La roche posay uh, grant, uh, which is meant for residents, early career, um, you know, uh, dermatology practitioners, um, it's not a lot of money, but it could be enough. It could be a bridge to get you to the next level in terms of generating some preliminary data for a larger grant. Maybe it's you know an R21 NIH grant, um, or it's just to give you the street cred that you need to say, look at me, I'm fundable. You know, that's one of the first things these other agencies want to see. Like, what have you received before? Uh, and very often, you have to rely on your mentors for that support. That that you know. That, uh, that that cred, but if you get your own grant, something like this, that can really uh, propel you uh, to a higher level and really make you stand out amidst the other applicants for, for various grants. Because even beyond, you know, once again, we mentioned federal, uh, organizational, a lot of pharma companies have various grants. You know, keep a lookout. There are RFAs all the time, and uh, certainly having sat on these, 
um, one of the things we look at is have you received another grant? It's just, you know, it's inherent. You can't help yourself. You always want to look at that. So go after the low hanging fruit. Now, while it's nice to hopefully stand on your own, mentors make or break. Um, so that's another thing that we commonly look at. So if you're a resident or you're, you know, recently graduated after, uh, you know, maybe zero to five years out, um, it'd be very hard to believe that you can do it all on your own. And that's not to say that you're not amazing and wonderful and your mom thinks you're special, but it's really hard. Like you need a network, you need a support network. Um, and so who you work with directly. So for example, for me, when I got this grant, I was actually working in uh, Josh Nasanchuk's lab at Albert Einstein College of Medicine. He had carved out a little, you know, little nook for me with some lab space and, you know, gave me some support and I brought some money and st eager students who wanted to do derm. Um, but he was beyond supportive and he's always someone I can turn to, bounce ideas off of. So it's really important to identify mentors who will support you, who will maybe invest in you when you're kind of, you know, before you, you get a grant like this, uh, but also who you know really does matter in terms of them being able to open the networks uh, to then engage, whether it be someone on a grant committee uh, before they even know or you know you're gonna you're applying. Um, certainly who you know does play a, a big, big uh, difference. Now that's not always equitable. Um, however, if you know someone, they have a sense of who you are, what you can accomplish, and if they give you the money, will you actually follow through? So I think having that support is gonna be very important. Um, in terms of don't reinvent the wheel, um, it's very important if you have a, an idea or more importantly a question, first thing you should do is go to PubMed or some other search engine and make sure no one else has studied or done it before. Or if they have, they haven't done it as well as you could do it. Because the worst you can do is spend all this time writing a 10 page grant um, and some are even longer and someone else has already done it. So I think it's really important uh, to not reinvent the wheel and having good mentorship can really help you figure that out. As I, I feel like I frequently get um, ideas from students about projects and it's painful for me to say, yeah, we just did that, sorry, uh, but it's better than going through the whole rigmarole to find out someone else already did it. Now, when you're writing the grant, first things first, why should the person reviewing your grant care about what you're doing? So you got right out of the gate, hit them strong. Why is what you're doing important? How will it change things? How will it accelerate your ability to answer even more questions in this area? So you're right, think about the audience you're writing for, they're looking at a whole bunch of grants, why should they be your champion or cheerleader? Uh, and last but not least, which I'm sure we'll talk about over and over again, um, you don't lose, you learn. Uh, getting a grant on your first shot is is pretty rare these days. Uh, it probably was actually when I did this, because actually I applied the year that John won and I did not get it and I reapplied the next year. Do not be defeated. It's pretty common to actually not get it your first time, but learn from the process and just get better each time. Uh, if you just kind of kick, you know, kick the ground and walk away and hang your head low, um, you certainly didn't learn from the experience. And now, next slide, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Eichenfeld. Hello, thank you so much. Thanks for joining so us. being here today. Next slide, please. So my biggest advice, um, like Adam was saying, is to find good mentors, especially if you're an early career investigator, such as myself, they really are the key to success. So my story actually starts with this picture. And we all know what this is. This is in coup de sob morphia. So one day I was talking to one of my great mentors, Dr. Brian Sun, and we had a very crazy idea. So quite a few of us actually think that morphia is flashcoid. I mean, look how linear it must be. And there have already been whole exome sequencing studies trying to find a common mutation in the lesional skin of morphia patients, but so far these studies have all been unsuccessful. Interestingly, no one has ever looked at the non-coding regions, which is, wow, something that we're really interested in. So can morphia be the result of mutations in non-coding regions? It's very possible. So now that we had a question, we needed funding. Next line, please. Sequencing really isn't cheap. It's actually pretty expensive. It's getting cheaper and cheaper each and every day. Um, so do the project, I had to apply to a couple of places and that I did. And somehow people didn't think I was completely crazy. And then next line, and now I get to spend some time um, trying to answer a very cool question. 
Next slide, please. So here are my tips and tricks for getting a grant. Um, it's important to do your research and know what grants you are eligible to apply to. It's also important to look at successful grants. Like if you're interested in applying to a grant, you want to talk to people who actually received the grant before and see um, how, whether or not you would be able to get the grant and whether or not what they were looking for for that grant. Um, I shouldn't give you all of my secrets, but there's actually a really great book called the Grant Application Writer's Workbook that literally gives you step-by-step -step instructions on how to write a grant. Um, please show the picture, please. Thank you. Um, and the next line, sometimes you're going to need to apply for a grant more than once and cast a wide net. Make sure when you submit a grant application, um, the second time you actually respond to the reviewer's comments from the prior submission. For example, um, like Adam, I also was very persistent and applied to this La roche Posay grant twice. Um, the first time they told me, interesting, but maybe, maybe not. And then the second time I had a little bit more preliminary data that I included in my application, which I guess helped. And then finally, could you please advance it one more time? Um, I know that we're all very passionate about our research, but truthfully, don't take it personally if you don't get a grant. It doesn't mean that the grant agency doesn't like you or your idea wasn't a good one. Sometimes there might have been other grants that sounded just a little bit more reasonable. And sometimes granting agencies just want to fund the people that sound like they're going to get it done. So it's always okay to try again. And I think um, that's probably the most important part is to be passionate about your work and then keep trying and, um, and don't get too scared or reluctant if you don't get it the first time. Next slide, please. Okay, I think that's it for me. So before you take off, Dr. Agba, mm -hmm. two questions for you. And uh, just a reminder, everyone, please submit your questions um, for uh, the end of the panel. Um, I'm gonna hit on kind of two for each Dr. Harris and Dr. Eichenfeld, and then uh, you know we'll, we'll go, to the, go to the phone, so to speak. So the first question, Dr. Eichenfeld, is where do you find the grants? You know, where where is it? You know, you have this great book listed here, mm -hmm. but where where can someone who wants to write a grant has an idea, needs it funded? Is, is there you know a magical list that's hidden in the dark web? Where do you go? <laughs> the dark web. That really reminds me. I I feel like I keep on getting notifications that my social security numbers on the dark web. <laughs> <laughs> it is actually. It is. It probably is. <laughs> Anyways, there are there are lists on the dark web um, look for the lists that are actually um, look like good lists anyways there are lots of different societies that have good funding opportunities for example if you're studying a disease related to kids like me um, you can apply for a grant from um, a society for pediatric dermatology or from the pediatric research dermatology research alliance there's also like the american skin association Derm Foundation, and there's so many different ones. You just kind of need to um, know where to look. Like I know that the Medical um, Derm Society has one um, too, Skin of Color has one. And then those are the smaller funding opportunities that the different societies. Your academic institute will also have lists of different funding opportunities. And they, um, they usually have a whole like sub department or subdivision that handles that. And you just need to go through their list and then find the grants that really apply to your area of study. And then like Dr. Friedman was saying, different companies will also have press releases um, regarding different funding opportunities. So you should be on the lookout for those. There's that, lots that was, of things out there, yeah. Yeah, that was very comprehensive. And yeah, to that point, if, you, if you're at an institution, very often, you're, you're talking about like the, there's an office dedicated to this, they'll mm -hmm. often curate emails related to your area of study. So at GW, for example, every couple of weeks, I'll get an email about grants in dermatology or maybe grants in cancer. You could actually get multiple. Mm -hmm. um, not to mention, and this might be cheating a little bit, a lot of institutions, if you go on their website and go to their um, Office of Grant Support or Research Support, they'll actually have open access lists of all the societies. Uh, I believe I, Albert Einstein College of Medicine had this. Uh, it takes a little work, but you know, at that point, there's so many grants out there that are like maybe five to 15K, 
Um, usually, you know, maybe you'll have a handful of people applying, especially if it's a rare disease state. Um, and, and certainly that will uh, make your chances higher to then get the bigger grant after that. All right, question number two, and I have no idea how you're gonna answer this. How would you write a good grant? <laughs> I don't even know if I can write a good grant, so I don't <laughs> think I can answer this question. <laughs> But I do know how to cheat to try to write a good grant. So first of all, um, if you're at an academic institute, they have workshops that try to teach you to write grants. Um, I didn't ever go to a workshop, but I I did um, I did a like a PhD. So during that time, they kind of try to teach you to write a grant because they hope that you're going to stay in academics later and maybe write grants. So that's what I did. Um, there's also classes that you can take on the subject. Um, but if you don't have time for that, you can always look at the workbook that I flashed that's on the screen right now, the Grant Writer's Workbook. Um, it's actually really, really good. And it has, it actually gives you really detailed instructions on how to phrase things, on um, how many times you should talk about rationale or just things like that. So I feel like it's a really good book to have on the back burner. You don't have to read it cover to cover, but it's a really great reference book. Um, and it, I, I forget how much it costs, maybe like $40 or something like that, but it is funding the NIH or the NSF. So it's a good investment. Um, and then the last thing I just wanted to say is it's always good to try to write your grant early um, because if you write it early enough, you can have more people read it. And Oftentimes you can have people who know more about grants read it and then they, they can give you advice and then you can make your grant better and then you have a greater likelihood of getting it funded, of course. That was, that was fantastic advice. Uh, you know, I'll add on to the mentorship component here in that um, if you have a, like a host of mentors, ask them to see some of their grants. You know, mm -hmm. I think there, there is a style that is more successful than others and, and certainly looking how others who are successful at, at, at receiving these awards, how they craft their grants. Um, give yourself, you're absolutely, give yourself enough time. I, I can't tell you how many times I've heard, oh my God, I'm rushing to finish an R01. And I'm like, you're gonna shoot yourself if you do it that mm -hmm. way. Like, take your time, build it, and then practice makes perfect, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Great advice, thank you so much. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna bring up the Vitiligo Vixen, Dr. John Harris, who as I mentioned earlier, um, was actually the reason I even learned about this um, this, this grant program. Uh, so that's also a plug for some of the. Oh no! You, really, really, <laughs> Un unbelievable! You're, you're lucky this is virtual. I'm that's very proud guy. of my big check. <laughs> um, I had it shipped back from the AAD so I could keep it. <laughs> uh, but the reason I knew about that check was looking actually at practical dermatology. So um, I do encourage you to kind of uh, you know flip through the dermatologist, derma, uh, practical dermatology, Germ News, Germ Times, as they do highlight some of these calls for applications. And if you just miss it, you'll miss it. And those deadlines come up pretty quickly. Dr. Harris, take it away. Sure. Thanks, Adam. Um, happy to be here. And thankful that uh, La Roche-Posay uh, funded me. It was... I put this slide up there. I'm now famous, I think infamous for, for not getting a lot of grants. Um, this slide was supposed to illustrate that. Um, I, it took me eight tries to get my first R01. Um, and uh, and we, we certainly get into to, to strong slumps. Anybody does. And, and so it, it can be very, very difficult to get funding. I agree with Adam that, that having grants uh, helps you get more for sure. Uh, gives you a lot of confidence to keep going. Um, but the point here is is that La Roche Posay was my first grant I ever received in 2008 for to, to study vitiligo, uh, and I haven't looked back. So for the last what now 13 years, still studying vitiligo, still doing more and more things. Um, there there is an indication here the Stiefel Award that was from the Derm Foundation. Uh, that's was a foundation award that funded uh, data that led to founding a new company called Valeris. Uh, therapeutics. And, and so that wasn't even NIH funded, that was foundation funding. And so I'm really glad I applied for that grant. Um, and, and, and so the string comes from, from starting somewhere. And I think it's important to, to get started. And, and La roche Posse is a great place to, to start. Uh, next slide. So tips and tricks, uh, you know, I, I, it just takes a lot of work, I think. Um, and and in order to, to to put the effort in, I think you have to find what you're really passionate about. That that term comes up a lot, and I've I've had people tell me, um, "Wow, I can really tell you're passionate about this." Um, usually, it's talking about vitiligo, and I never know if that's a compliment or or not. Um, 
because they don't say that it's what I said was interesting. They said, I can tell you're passionate. Uh, but that's what it takes. I think something's got to pull you out of bed um, to get up and, and do what you do that day. Um, when you get a rejection from a grant, you got to keep going. There's got to be something that picks you up and, and keeps you, you know, pursuing that 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 project or that interest. Um, and, and so you have to love it, and it has to be, you know, super interesting to you. Um, and and it's what I think about all the time. And, and so it's a pleasure to write grant after grant because uh, I know what we're studying and what we're interested in is 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 super fun for me. Um, I, I, I say to keep it simple um, because a lot of times you, you feel like you need to just you need to explain all your great ideas and put them all down and, and talk about why it's such an amazing idea and you do but um, reviewers really need need to be able to follow it and understand it and and my my mentor um, my postdoc mentor said you have to be able to write a grant so that somebody drinking a beer while watching a football game can still follow it by the end because that's most of, mostly what your reviewers are doing. Uh, so keep that in mind. Keep it simple. Um, keep it high level so that it's not hard to follow. I think you have to, similar to, to what Adam said, you have to, you know, why should I care? Tell them why it matters. Um, so let's say, let's assume that everything you're proposing is true. And let's assume that you're the right person to, to accomplish these goals. And let's assume that you, all your experiments are successful and your hypothesis is correct. Um, what's the impact of that? Does, does that help people? Um, is it going to advance our knowledge somehow? Is it going to um, really, really change what we do in some way, whether it's clinically or in research? Um, you, you really have to explain why it matters uh, and, and, and assuming everything is correct. I think, you know, it's really important to talk about what you've done previously to support what your, what your idea is. Um, it's great if you've done it yourself. Uh, if you've done a lit search and, and you put this whole thing, this idea together, tell them about the lit search. Tell them about the pieces that fit together. Um, you know, why is this hypothesis correct? Why? And, and if it has a big impact, um, you know, why, why is it likely that you're going to succeed? So those are all important things. Um, and then I, I always think it's important to talk about what, what you're going to do next. So, you know, you, you, you may have a, a million ideas. You don't want to put them all into one grant because that looks too ambitious, too impossible to actually achieve. But you can say, look, this is my idea. Um, this is my hypothesis. These are the experiments I'm going to do. When, that's, when, when I've identified whether that hypothesis is correct or not, this is my plan next. And this is what I'm going to impact next. This is the other disease I'm going to, I'm going to go after. Or this is how I'm going to take it forward to the next step to make it a therapeutic. Um, I, I, think, I think that's really important to think about what the next step is and, and tell your reviewers you know, where you're going to go next after this is done. Um, and it's just as important to talk about what if it's not correct? What if you're, so it's very rare that my hypothesis is correct. Um, there, there are always nuances and things that, that we have to adjust as we go along. That's what science is. But if your hypothesis is wrong, it still has value. And so tell the reviewers that. Tell, tell them why, if you're wrong, it's still really important or, or how you're going to pivot to, to pursue something else that, that really makes a difference. So those are the tips and tricks. I think the, the biggest, the most important one is to just get out of bed and keep going. And, and, and when, you, when you fail, get back up and, and try again, because uh, that's what it took. I almost gave up after seven R01 applications were not funded. Uh, and I had a couple people tell me that they wouldn't live with me if I, if I quit. <laughs> so I submitted one more and that was it. But, you know, the point was I can't submit a thousand. You know, I got to give up sometime. But uh, evidently seven wasn't, seven wasn't the time. Great. Today is so not you, that day. <laughs> um, you, you said two things that I think are so inherently important, regardless of what type of grant you're, you're submitting. One is, what is the potential impact? So there was, there was a time in the era of probably Bell Labs where you could study something versus the sake of studying it because you wanted to study it. It didn't have to necessarily translate to the human condition. Those days are long gone, probably because of financial reasons. So there has to be something translatable. If you're doing basic science and you're studying a protein, um, or, or any of their phospholipid, there has to be something translated to the bedside, you know, and you have to paint that in, in your grant. You may not get there in that grant, but you need to show the direction you're, you're going in. And the other thing you said, which I love, is that is data. If you're wrong, if you're right, it's still data, and you learn something. And so the fact that you're wrong doesn't mean that it's bad. It just means you've learned something different than you assumed. Um, and so I, I think that's a great point that talk about if, if for example, it doesn't go right, what are you going to do next? And I think that's where, and I just actually saw a grant like this, where if you're too focused, if you have, it's just really kind of linear thinking, you're too focused and everything, every step relies on the previous step 
and if something goes wrong, then you're done. You need to be able to lateralize too. So let's say your, your question doesn't get answered the way you want. How are you going to pivot from there and redirect and study in a different way? So I think those are those yeah, two. Good point. I, I had a grad student who um, w used a knockout mouse to try to make vitiligo better um, because we thought that a protein was, was really important in driving vitiligo. And so we knocked it out to see what would happen. And vitiligo got about four times worse in that mouse. The mouse just like lost all its pigment faster than any mouse I'd ever seen. Um, and, and so clearly we didn't want to do that for patients, um, but we could pivot that and use that as a treatment for melanoma, right? So vitiligo is the opposite of melanoma. If we, if we mess something up in the lab and all of a sudden vitiligo gets way worse, um, we can flip it and turn it into a melanoma treatment, which was, uh, which was a lot of fun. So, so that's, that's one example of, of how you can kind of keep an open mind. That is data. Um, so I, I got two questions for you, and then we're going to go to the phones. Um, so first, which I think we all, as you were just mentioning, have suffered from this, how difficult it is to actually get a grant funded. How do you deal with it, short of almost giving up after seven? How do you deal when you get the pink slip or you know, get the, 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 ex, you know, the letter saying you didn't get funded and there's absolutely no explanation whatsoever? And I don't know. Um, it, it's actually, <laughs> it's, it, it, it's super hard. Um, and that's, that's one of the things that, you know, it's the curse of the scientist. I, I couldn't do anything else. My wife told me that. She's like, I couldn't live with you if you weren't doing science. So she was one of the ones that made me submit another grant. It, it, and it was the truth. It was, it was, you know, if I give up, I'm, I'm going to be miserable the rest of my life. So I, I, I have to do it. It was just, you know, I have to do. Um, you know, you can certainly recycle ideas. You can make them better, get more preliminary data. Dawn said that, right? She got more preliminary data to improve things. Um, it, you know, it, the, the effort that goes into writing a grant, eventually the grant can be 120 pages long if you're applying for an R01 or, or if you're for a P grant, I submitted one that was 550 pages long and I didn't get that one, right? So now I've got, I wrote 550 page grant that didn't get funded. What, do you, what on earth do you do with that? And how do you get up after that? Um, but you know, you use it. So those ideas are down on paper. They maybe weren't good enough at the time, but, but they can be used again, uh, and they can be improved and, and put into another context. Um, you know, maybe the P couldn't get funded, but maybe a part of that P could get turned into an R or maybe, you know, at this case, when, when you're not thinking about an R, you're thinking just, you know, about a K08 or, or career development award, a piece of that might work for something else. Um, you, you should also know too, you, you can't write an R uh, to get a, a La Roche Posse grant, right? So it's got to fit. What what you're writing has to fit. You've got to propose something that that's doable in that year, um, that's fundable with that amount. Um, and, and so you kind of have to think through that. But um, yeah, it's tough when you don't get them because <laughs> that happens a lot. There should be a support network um, for. Oh, I, I would that. also. Yeah, there should be, and we should we should call each other. Call me, you know, if you if you're having trouble. <laughs> I, I actually. Called my mentor, my old postdoc mentor, uh, a couple of weeks ago, and we had a, a good hour and a half long talk about not getting grants and, and how to move forward. It's it's tough, uh, but but I, I would also what I've done is I've really diversified, um, so I don't completely rely on the NIH uh, R ones. I don't completely rely on foundations. Um, philanthropy is a good opportunity, certainly if you're a physician scientist and you see patients and you treat them for their disease and they know you're doing research in it, that's that's a great opportunity. Um, pharmaceutical companies, if they're interested in the disease that you study, uh, great opportunity, right? Um, got, I got venture funding to start a company. Um, so they, there, are, there are different ways uh, to, to, to fund your research and, and really diversifying is a great way to, to think about it and go about it if you can. Absolutely. Now, now to your point about you're so passionate about vitiligo, how did that happen? I think, you know, we're told you got to find your passion. You got to find the disease that just makes you wake up in the morning and smile and want to put in 12 hours. It's not easy. How did you get so excited with, with the logo? Yeah. It, 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 I get asked, asked that question a lot. And, uh, and it's funny, it's different for everybody. I remember when I was at training uh, in residency at Penn, uh, a lot of people became, found their passion and became experts simply because Bill James said, you know, nobody studies this thing and we need an expert. Like we, we need a new expert and then why don't you do it? And, and, and actually a lot of people were like, all right, you know, Adam Rubin, I'm pretty sure is a, is a nail expert because of that. Um, and, and there are a lot of other people that, that Bill has really inspired that way for me though. Uh, so, so the, the, the short and probably wrong answer is that my grandmother had vitiligo. Uh, I, I definitely remember, 
uh, her modeled hands, uh, depigmented hands when I was growing up, but she died when I was five. And I kind of forgot until my aunt uh, asked me what I would, you know, and I finished, she's like, wow, you've been in school a long time. What are you, what are you going to do now? And I was like, I'm a vitiligo expert. And she's like, didn't your grandmother have that? And I was like, did she? And I dug up old pictures and, and actually saw that, I, you know, I've got a, this great picture of her eating breakfast with my grandfather and clearly had, had uh, depigmentation all over her hands. Um, but because I didn't remember that, that probably didn't drive it. What actually I think um, really prompted it was um, I, I was very interested in type 1 diabetes. I have a cousin with type 1 diabetes. I joined a lab that studied type 1 diabetes. And uh, I got really, really frustrated that I couldn't study it in humans. I was studying mouse cells in a dish to try to understand how to make type 1 diabetes better. And I very naively kept saying, why are we studying mice? And why are we studying cells in a dish? Why don't we study humans? And people would pat me on the head and say, well, that's a nice thought, but that's not really possible. And um, I learned that I, I really hated endocrinology. And so I went to my advisor and I was like, well, you know, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I don't want to be an endocrinologist and I don't want to study diabetes. I want to study human disease. And he said, that's OK. There's, there's lots of, you know, lots of autoimmunity that you could study. And maybe you could maybe you could help diabetes by studying another disease in humans. Um, and I was like, yeah, maybe that's kind of cool. And, and he said, you should think about dermatology because that the skin's right there and there's a bunch of stuff that happens in it. And, and maybe you'll find something interesting there. And so. Um, what, it, it's funny, actually, true story. So late one night, I was on call overnight. It was maybe 10 o'clock at night. And, and I saw my mentor, Aldo Rossini, who is a diabetes expert, walking down the hallway to, to meet me. And he said, John, I have a patient I want you to meet. And he brought me to the intensive care unit to meet this 20-year-old woman, new onset uh, uh, diabetes, type 1 diabetes. She was in diabetic ketoacidosis. And she'd received glucose and insulin, and she was getting better. But he said, why don't you do a physical exam? And, uh, and so I said, all right, I listened to her heart and it sounded fine. I sat her up to listen to her lungs and she had a giant patch of vitiligo on her back. And I said, huh, that's interesting. When did that happen? And she said, oh, it all happened at the same time. And it turned out she had, she also had a goiter. So she had type one diabetes, vitiligo, Hashimoto's thyroiditis and pernicious anemia. She, she got all at the same time. So I said, I can get that skin. I want to be a dermatologist. I want to be a vitiligo expert and I want to study autoimmunity. And, and the, the purpose was, I thought maybe human vitiligo would be a good model, human model of type one diabetes that I could have access to. Um, and so since then I've been studying vitiligo. And of course now I, I fell in love with vitiligo for its own sake, not, not as a model anymore, but love my patients and, and love making them better and, 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 and making progress. And, uh, and it's, it's a whole lot of fun. And so, you know, partway about five years into my career, I, I really focused on translational research approaches and, uh, and, and use that, um, to, to, to do what we do. That's Sorry, that was maybe great. a longer story than you no, expected. No, no, thank Grand you. Was, thank you for fantastic. sharing. <laughs> no, that was great. Uh, before I bring Dawn back on for some Q&A, I'm going to turn it back to Tyler to talk a little bit more about the grant, and then uh, we'll answer your questions. Thank you so much. Learn something new. Uh, also want to share, and normally I never do corrections, but I, I actually come from Worcester, Massachusetts, so when I hear Worcester, as Roxanne said, I always have to laugh. <laughs> Thank you, Tyler. It's Wista. 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 <laughs> yeah. Um, so the grant uh, process is very simple to apply. If you don't mind going to the next slide, um, it really can be around any topic in dermatology. We've had things win that are on the microbiome. We had one really interesting project. I think it may have been from Brian's son, actually, on snake venom. Um, uh, it was great to hear his name mentioned by Donna as being one of her, her mentors. Um, pick a topic that's interesting to you. Take into account the thing these uh, amazing researchers have, have talked about tonight. Make sure that no one else has done it recently uh, because, as Don mentioned, actually, I remember a couple of years ago, we had a really interesting project that was exceptionally well written. And the doctor said, well, you know, a lot of stuff has been done in this space already. This other application is very novel and interesting. And that is what moved forward. Applications are due by June 5th. Uh, we plan to announce the winners at AAD, and um, hopefully um, the winners are able to join us at AAD. You can send your email applications to me by email or hard mail. I'm not sure if people are still doing hard mail, but you're welcome to send it that way to me at Hudson Yards in New York. Otherwise, my email is tyler.steel at l'oreal.com. You can also find me on LinkedIn if you want to message me there with any questions or if you just want to chat about the grant process. 
Um, I hope that this was informative and uh, I'll now turn it over to the doctors to answer any questions you all may have. So once again, if you have any questions, please submit them in the question chat pane on the right hand side of your screen. And we also would like to thank again La Roche Posay for making this educational event possible. So Dr. Friedman, the phones are ringing. <laughs> All right, uh, we got a couple of questions. I, I'll, I'll start with the first one and then pass it down the, the line. Um, so the question is, is it possible to approach companies directly to ask for a non-publicized grant or source of funding? Any issues with this? No, that's actually a great idea. And I think John alluded to that. So, so first off with industry, most major pharma companies, especially the biological companies, they have an entire like med ed section where they have grants for fellows. They have grants for, you know, um, investigator initiated studies. And this could be anything from asking for drug or funding for, um, you know, whatever you need. This is totally separate from the call for applications. So I think first step is look on the websites of all these companies or do a Google search. You know, you can, I'm not going to name a company to play favorites, but like blank medical education grants. And you'll get to their portal. They all have like the same type of kind of portal where you have to put in your information, your W two or nine. I don't know taxes. Um, and, and those are those are round the year. Those 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 are constant. You know, you can put those in. And I'll say when I was at Einstein, um, I had two fellows, and I got funding almost every year. I was there from a just saying Janssen fellowship grant, and that's all sorts for salary support for fellows. Um, so if you, you know, if you are, have a busy practice or you're a busy junior academic and you need to see patients, but you have these great ideas and you need someone with boots on the ground doing it, we know those fellows are out there, but we should be paying them. And so that's an easy way to get funding. Um, you know, the other thing that, you know, John mentioned in terms of just going to someone with an idea, that's where creating relationships are so important. You know, you can't just like grab someone by the arm who's walking down the hall in your practice, put some samples in and say, like, hey, hey, you, I'm a dermatologist, please give me some money. You need to woo them. It's like, you know, you're a couple of dates in, you know, you got to talk to them, get to know them, know their family, show pictures of your kids. And, and, and in that process, start sharing, you know, what you like, what you do, um, and, and really get them on your side. And then they'll introduce you to the next person and then the next person kind of climb up. So at some point, people will come to you and say, what is your big idea? You know, pitch it to me. I, I want to, we, we have money to fund because they actually have buckets of money that they have to spend every year. So that's where I think creating relations with industry is so hugely important. They are not the devil, clearly, um, you know, and, and they can certainly fast track your career in, in a major way, but you have to establish that good relationship first. Um, you know, uh, just just in order, Don, what, what are your thoughts on that? I think you had you brought up a lot of good points. Um, personally, as someone who's really early in my career, I really haven't had as much um I guess as much um, funding and things from companies. Um, I've mostly like looked at different societies. I think La Roche is the first um, grant that I got from a company, which is really exciting. I think I've definitely. Um, I think next year when I'm I'm going to stay on as faculty, so I'm probably going to look into more like investigator initiated trials and things like that. Mm -hmm. Great, John. Yeah, I, so eight or nine years ago, I started cold calling companies and I started with AbbVie because they're literally right across the street from us at, at UMass. I was like, you guys are interested in autoimmunity. I'm interested in autoimmunity. Let's get together. Let's do something um, and, and got literally nowhere. So um, that, that's probably not a great way to go. Um, but yeah, I agree with developing relationships really important. Um, I, I, you know, I'll tell a story. It's not my story, but um, David Rosmarin at Tufts, actually, uh, we, so we, we showed that oral ruxolitinib in a patient repigmented him in vitiligo, and Brett King showed that uh, oral tofacitinib repigmented a patient, and so David wrote a, an investigator-initiated research grant to uh, Insight and said, hey, you know, I want to try it topically, um, and, uh, and, and this was after he'd done 11 patients or so and, and kind of made up his own cream, and, and it worked, and so he wrote, an, you know, an IIR that eventually uh, that supported the, actually supported those 11 patients. And then that launched a phase two clinical trial that we just published in the Lancet six months ago. It's gonna be the, probably the first FDA approved treatment for vitiligo. Um, and phase three trial is, is wrapping up with 600 patients all over the world. So that, that all started with an IIR and 11 patients from David Rosmarin. Um, so so that's, that can happen. Um, and and so you know if you know if you know people and and you know they're interested in your disease and you have a good idea you know tell them it, it can turn into something. But don't come on as strong as you did is what you're telling me. <laughs> 
yeah, you know, I, I don't know. I, eventually we started, I, I, now I work with AbV, and it, but yeah, it's, it's easier if they approach you. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> ease in, ease into the relationship. Nobody cared like about vitiligo nine years ago. That's that was the problem. <laughs> that is, I mean, that, that's true of a lot of diseases, and we're seeing a big shift in that, which is which is wonderful. And I think to that end, as you know, as you are going out in the world and developing your clinical interests, that's where you can marry your your research interests. And that it, it'd be hard to like separate the two. Um, you know, you heard interest in morphia, do research in morphia. Mm-hmm. Interest in vitiligo, do it's it's hard to do research something that you do you don't see at all in the clinic because you need to see the light end of the tunnel. Like what you're doing should matter for the patients you're seeing the next day. Um, no, that's 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 great advice. All right, next question: um, Are you more likely to get approved for an idea that's been tried in a small study or a case study or something that hasn't been tried at all? Uh, John, I'll let you start with that one. Yeah, comments on preliminary data, I guess. Uh, you know, so how much support do you have for your idea? There, there are some grants, uh, the Stephen Katz grant right now at the NIH um, requires no preliminary data. So you can't mention preliminary data. It's supposed to be about a new idea, a new direction um, that, that has, you know, you haven't worked on before. That's kind of what they're excited about. And that's what that grant mechanism is for. For most grants, though, if you've done something previously that supports, you know, your your hypothesis, then then that's where you're gonna you're you're gonna go a lot further. So, um, I would say in most cases for your traditional grants, absolutely, if you can support it with with a little, little bit of preliminary data and observation you made in the clinic, it's gonna go further. Don, um, I completely agree. I think for some of the smaller grants, when you write for them, it's okay either way as long as. Um, the grant makes sense and you have really good, um, you did a really good PubMed search and you have really good ideas and you, your, your um, experiments or what you're going to do sound very feasible and you have good stuff to back it up. For bigger grants, I do think they want to see preliminary data um, and they want to see that it's accomplishable and they want to also see that you yourself are dedicated to what's going to happen and you have, um, if you yourself don't have like the skill set or if you don't have um, the lab space or something like that, you have collaborators or mentors who are willing to help out and chip in. So at the end of the day, I think it's the whole package that really decides whether or not you get funded or not. No, I, I completely agree. Mm-hmm. I think, and, and if you don't have preliminary data, something you can consider, you know, and that's where mentorship comes in, you can utilize published data from your mentor saying, this is what our lab does. Mm-hmm. I wanna take this technique, which is validated, it's been peer reviewed and I wanna apply it to X, Y, and Z. So I think that gives you some standing. The other is having the time. And I've seen grants where it's a beautifully written grant, the person has no dedicated effort. So how are you gonna complete the project if you don't have the time to do it? So I think it's very important you make it clear that whether you want, you know, in, in, in private practice or an in institution that you've been given that time to actually be successful or, or you're not going to be. But no, I think that was, that was great advice. Um, all right, well, we got a whole bunch more questions and not a lot of time. Let's see here. Um, all right, that is a similar question. Um, so this is this, and I actually don't have a great answer for this. Well, actually, I take that back. I might have an answer for this. So one question was, what would be the best place to apply for a grant to study treatment of acne scars? So the Acne and Rosacea Society, um, ARS, they have a, I think it's roughly a ten to fifteen thousand dollar grant for no surprise, acne and rosacea. So I would check out their website. They usually award several of these every year, um, as well as if you're thinking about something more mechanistic, um, Derm Foundation grants could also be useful for that. Um, Let's see. Um, So uh, someone gave a shout out to UMass. Good John. Um, And and they asked, um, I I actually don't know the answer. Maybe um, Tyler, you can answer this. (laughs) Um, they're asking if, um, if if the application is open uh, to other professionals like nurse practitioners or physician assistants. Today we only know if it open for dermatologists, but that's certainly something we can consider for next year. Wouldn't be fair to open it at this point because we've already published it for um, dermatologists only. But great suggestion, and something for us to keep in mind as we try to grow this grant program, and we have been able to do that. We grew it from. Uh, 20,000 to last year, 35,000, and I have this year budgeted to do 40,000. So get them applications in. <laughs> Great, thank you for that. Um, okay, let's see. Oh, so this is actually, so, so for someone who's relatively new to the grant scene, 
Um, and, and maybe John, given your experience at NIH, can you kind of go over some of the different names of the grants? We mentioned R21s, R01s, P awards. Can you maybe give like a you know a quick 101 on the different types of awards are, that are available that more go by uh, you know nomenclature than actually a name? Yeah. Um, so early on, probably the the earliest grant you'll you'll start thinking about maybe is a K08 um, for from the NIH or an F31. F31 is funds fellowships. So if you're a fellow and you're still in training, you're a postdoc, you can apply for an F31 to support you. Um, a K08 is kind of a transitional career development award where you get you know a, a significant amount of funding, and the goal is that it should carry you into uh, an independent research career. Once you're there, there are 21s. They're, they're two-year grants for $275,000 to, you know, where there's not a lot of preliminary data, but the, you've got a great idea and, and you need to generate it in order to get the bigger grant. Uh, R01 is is the, the workhorse of the NIH. That's uh, $250,000 standard a year. Um, you've got to have a lot of preliminary data and a great idea for that. Um, and uh, then there are some others. I actually got a R33, R61, which is kind of cool. It's called a risk award, where it's a high risk idea, but it, if it works, it, it could generate a lot of really cool data and, 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 be, and pay off. Um, R03s are, are smaller. Um, those are uh, $50,000 a year for a few years. So um, it's a lot to think about. Um, and and don't, don't forget there are DP awards. The DP1 or DP2, I think, is for new investigators that just have an earth shattering idea. And it's even more than an R01, but you're not supposed to, you know, you don't, you don't need to have a lot of preliminary data. So th that can be like a knock it out of the park type of thing. Uh, you you got to spend some time Googling it and reading about it. There's a, there's a lot out there. Mm -hmm. Don't John, anything to add to that? Um, I haven't applied to any of those yet. That's hopefully in my future. But I just wanted to put in a little, um, just a little blurb about um, the Durham Foundation and Career Development Awards. I feel like right before you get your first K award, you can probably bridge that with maybe a career development award or a small like mini grant from either Derm Foundation. I know the Pediatric Dermatology Research Alliance now has their own CDA and sometimes like the American Skin Association has stuff too. Um, so I actually, this year I actually was able to get um, my first CDA. So I'm hoping that'll like bridge me into some more research during like my early days as a faculty member um, before applying for one of those like mega multiple hundred page grants with the NIH. <laughs> 550 pages. Yeah. I didn't get it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so, so glad. You, I'm so glad you brought up CDAs. And, and to that point, I have no question in my mind that um, this grant probably then which followed Women's Derm uh, and ASDS grant were probably the stepping stone to get a CDA. And for those who yeah. don't know, the Derm Foundation CDAs, it's salary support. It is to buy your freedom so you can get the job done. Um, and I believe it's, it may have changed, but from what I recall, it's like 55K for three years. Mm -hmm. It is you know, renewable you to submit a progress mm -hmm. report. Um, but that's a lot of money to get free time to do research. Um, uh, but it is competitive. And so getting a, a grant like this can no question put you ahead of the pack. Um, so I'm really glad yeah. you, you brought that up. Uh, yeah, and definitely. then to your point, EDA to K award. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a nice, um, it's absolutely a nice transition. All right, it is 8.01. We are out of time. Thank you so much, Drs. Harris, Eichenfeld. Thank you, Tyler and uh, LaRoche Brosse and L'Oreal and Roxanne and her team uh, for allowing us to share our experience and expertise. And this will be available recorded, correct? Absolutely. So you can watch it over and over again. <laughs> You're welcome. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you all. Bye. Bye.